Holly, thanks a lot for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. Thanks for doing this. Thank you. Hey, um, so you had and you still are having a quite illustrious career on Wall Street, and you've been doing this for 35 years. And you also blog at your own website, Convexity in Maven, which you've been uh, maintaining despite um, different employers that you've been involved with. Why don't, we, why don't we talk about Convexity a little bit? It's something that very few people really understand, including me. But it's becoming, and Nassim Taleb has been really promoting this in his last two books, it's becoming a new measure of risk. Maybe you can help us understand what does convexity mean and what does it mean to you also? Well, thank you for having me. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, whatever time it is. Um, let's take a step back. There's really three risk metrics when you think about uh, a bonds, fixed income securities. Um, there's duration, there's credit, there's convexity. Duration is when you get your money back, credits if you get it back, and convexity is how you get it back. Those three things have always been there and they've never changed. It's just that people have not focused on convexity. If you want to go and explain convexity to your mother, what you would say is, uh, if I place a bet and I can make a dollar or lose a dollar, that's zero convexity. It's a linear return. If I can make two, lose one, that's positive. If I could lose three, make two, that's negative. And so what convexity is really talking about is, is the return profile symmetric or asymmetric? Positive convexity is, is good, clearly, because you can make more than you could lose, but you have to pay for that. Um, and, and, and negative convexity is, is, is bad, and usually you receive the money for that. Uh, so if you think about an option, what you're really doing is you're buying or selling that convexity, that payoff profile, per se. Um, yeah. what, uh, so, and, and I would continue that, that, you know, what you've seen over the last, you know, decades, and I wrote about this uh, uh, in a past commentary, is that whenever you see a big blow up, you always see convexity, negative convexity, you know, lurking behind the scenes. Uh, almost all of our big explosions have been basically there's some kind of negative convexity embedded in the market or embedded with portfolios that people are unfamiliar with or uncomfortable with, and uh, it can become explosive. So that, that's the big deal. Yeah, I read through a couple of your newsletters, and um, I, I, I'm surprised how much I understood that you write really well, and do you also go into the math, but you also make it understandable. And I, I remember that one example, and I think that was mm -hmm. positive convexity. Correct me if that's wrong. So basically, it's a startup founder. It's an entrepreneur, right? So it's uh, someone who holds a lot of equity, and potentially you can describe this as a call option, someone who has unlimited upside, but can only lose what this stock is worth, right? That might not be that much in terms of starters. When we start out, they're not worth much. And, uh, and that's positive convexity, correct? Uh, well, the way I've defined it, of course it is. I mean, when you buy a stock, I mean, all you can lose is what you paid for it, and it can go up a lot more. I mean, I, I suppose Amazon or Tesla are examples of incredible convexity. And if you look at the people who are, you know, our richest people now, um, most of them have gotten it uh, through uh, a company where they own stock and they own equity in the company. Uh, one can define, I mean, if you've got, I mean, I'm a UChicago MBA, I'm a monetarist, um, and, you know, what you saw when you go to like, you know, uh, Capital Markets 101 is that a company is basically the value of a company is its stocks and bonds, right? Um, and you could think of the bonds as being the strike price because they get paid first. If a company liquidates, the bondholder gets paid first, that's the strike. And the equity holder gets everything above the value of the bonds. Yeah. And so, uh, so that, that's a way you could model a company. And as an example for negative convexity, I was thinking, I don't know, again, correct me if that's wrong, are people who bought into the pre-financial crisis um, structured products, right? So the idea was that they were ranked as triple A and you would only get a maximum return, whatever it was, 4%, 5% a year, that was the interest rate. But you could lose your principal, and I think that's what happened to a lot of people. So the maximum they could earn was five, but they could lose everything, and it happened to, to quite a bunch of them. Why are you bothering to limit yourself to subprime bonds? Every bond has that characteristic where the most you can make is your principal plus the coupon and you could lose mm -hmm. 
Uh, I won't say infinite, but you can use a lot, right? So, yeah. um, and, and and if you want to structure uh, a bond, you could say, I'm long a treasury of some maturity, and I'm short a credit default swap against it, uh, and, and, and or a credit default option. Yeah. And, and, and that basically is the, uh, the extra income you get for taking credit risk over a treasury. And, and, and that's exactly how we price all these credit derivatives is by looking at the LIBOR or the treasury curve and then taking the difference. And you said that earlier, a lot of what we've seen in these big blow ups, and I think you, you also mentioned LTCM, which I still remember, we saw the great financial crisis and um, we've, we've just been through another one. You always, you say that's negative convexity and how how is it that these experienced investors don't see that right they, they, it seems it sounds like a bad deal to pretty much anyone who has a little street smart it sounds like a bad deal but it seems like the billions and trillions of of investors um, of investment money they still go in negative convexity why is that well uh, are you talking about the investor or the hedge fund manager because well, the, primarily the hedge the, the people who buy bonds, right? It sounds like a terrible deal. We have very low interest rates that are given to most bonds. We have high expectations of inflation. And why why on earth would you do it now oh, or even oh, five years ago? Uh, first off, no bad bonds, just bad prices. Okay. Every, I mean, I, I, I learned this, you know, early days on Wall Street uh, when I was a market maker. And, I, I, and someone, a salesman would say, well, put a price on XX security. And I'd say, I don't want to buy it. And he says, fine, then put a low price on it. So, yeah. I mean, I mean, there, there is a price for everything, almost yes. everything out there. Um, and, you know, what, you know, my career was basically in convexity, in mortgage bonds, callable securities, uh, contingent claims analysis. And, you know, if you think back, there's a reason why we hired physics PhDs in the 90s. Uh, in fact, that's almost all we hired. Uh, it's because we needed someone to go and figure out what is the option, the risk worth? And once you figure a fair value out, we could say, okay, do, do I believe that that concept, that structure? And then do I want to buy or sell around it? I mean, Mike Milken may have gotten, you know, a, a bad rep for doing, you know, a few unsavory things, but he did create the junk bond market with his, you know, late 70s, um, you know, UPenn thesis of, a portfolio of less than investment grade, so below triple B uh, bonds, that portfolio will yield more than you know another portfolio if it's diversified enough, which basically meant that the default risk embedded in these bonds uh, was too high. That you were yeah. that maybe the market was pricing in a, a eight percent default and realized defaults were six. And so you want to own a diversified portfolio of what was called junk bonds. Now it's called high yield bonds. Although frankly, uh, these bonds yield what three point nine five now. I would not call that high yield. Yeah, uh, <laughs> exactly. And, yeah. But but do you do you did you was there a secondary market though you could buy them at a discount? You just said that that it, just the price needs to be right, or they were they were sold at full value, like a hundred percent. You put all all the money in. Well, no, I, I mean, I mean, you know, I mean. All bonds trade at a, at a, at a price in the market once they're issued, yeah. um, and usually they're priced at a slight discount to fair value to entice people to buy a new security. I mean, there's a reason why IPOs tend to go up, you know, two, three, five percent uh, after the break, after they're uh, they're launched, because you want to entice people in to buy to take the risk, which is fair. I mean, when you see a, a stock double on, on 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 its IPO, one could argue that the the underwriter mispriced the security, um, but there's other reasons why they try to do these things sometimes to create some, you know, joy and, and excitement and headlines. Uh, yeah, but theoretically, exactly. you, you yeah. shouldn't be pricing things that far below, uh, uh, you know, fair value, market value. Yeah. But um, but so but going back to your question about hedge funds, um, you know, this, there's a problem with the structure of a hedge fund in the sense that, that if you pay someone two and twenty or one and a half and ten or whatever it might be you're giving that hedge fund guy a percent of the up, but he's not taking any losses on the way down. And so in that sense, uh, you've, you've basically misstructured the whole investment process where he's paid, um, he, I won't say he doesn't care if you lose, but he's, he, his incentive is, is, is to take more risk. Um, yeah. uh, so, Isn't so that the same for all of Wall Street? 
That's, no. That seems like you trade with other people's money, the bank's money, so to speak. And you, you put a lot of leverage on, and there's really no downside. Worst case, you go to the to another bank and say, well, they screwed me on that bank. But that is called the trader's option, uh, and, and that does occur. But how banks dealt with that is they go and they give you deferred comp, they do clawbacks, uh, or they pay you a lot of your comp compensation in uh, the firm's stock. And if they, if they give you enough stock, after a while, you actually do care about the firm. Okay. Um, yeah. uh, so these things do work. Sometimes they don't, um, but they, 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 they do tend to work. So, uh, yeah. so that's kind of fine. And, 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 you know, you'll see TV ads for money managers who uh, say we're aligned with a the client. Um, they're not lying. If they take a, a portion, a, a small fee of your total portfolio, as opposed to a larger fee of the gains, like hedge funds are taking a fee of the gains, right? Yeah. Um, that's a different incentive than saying, I'm going to take 25 or 50 basis points of your entire portfolio, because now you actually care about the whole, the performance and the level. So I would say yeah. those are the kinds of things. And also, you've gone away from paying a commission on trades, so you don't have the incentive to turn the portfolio over and over again. So, you know, uh, paying a fee on your entire portfolio while well, sometimes bothersome, uh, if the fee is fair, then you really aligned uh, all the interests. And, and that's, and, and that, of course, that's the best way. I mean, you know, when you think about it, you know, good management really is about putting the carrot in the right place. And a lot of what happened uh, in the great financial crisis uh, was that the carrot was in the wrong place. Actually, the carrot got shoved somewhere it shouldn't have gotten shoved, but um, the, the, the carrot was in the wrong place. Yeah, it seems like there is this, we, we go with the crowds and it's so much easier psychologically. And I, I think that's true. There is, there is this fear of missing out. And on the other hand, it's so much easier to go along with what you see all day and 90% of the people around you do. Even if you have that sinking feeling that something is wrong, this thing has extended too far. We see this with Bitcoin now, right? It doesn't matter where it's going. We all think it's a bubble. And I think everyone out there thinks it's a bubble, but we all know it could go much further. And uh, maybe we just want to be along for the ride. So I, I feel like the, the investment decisions at that point are not really rational. Some people like you, professionals, they're rational, but this probably the small minority. And even if they do, they're measured against the market every three months, six months. If you're like behind the market for two years, I don't know if you still have your job. Um, I, I think you've really hit on a number of interesting topics here. Uh, one of them is, what's your horizon? And does your horizon match your money manager's horizon? Um, you know, hedge funds that have monthly or quarterly, you know, horizons, um, that's kind of the wrong place to be if you're looking more distant. I mean, I assume at some point we'll get to the products I'm dealing in, and most of them are five, seven, 10 year investments, uh, long horizon, uh, where I'm going to size it properly and, and run with it um, because uh, I don't know what's happening tomorrow. And most of the things that, um, ex I don't want to say expire, but, but, but transactions, investments that are uh, one month, two months, six months, um, those are extraordinarily efficient. There's so much money flying in them because people uh, have to have liquidity uh, and they have to go and um, have uh, quarterly performance. Uh, I, 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 I view quarterly performance is, 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 is very bothersome because uh, I, 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 I don't know what's happening in, in, in the next few months, uh, but I can look further out and have a good idea of what might happen. Yeah, one thing why I really wanted to have you on that I think is, is not well understood is what happened in the markets in the last 12 months. A lot of people call it the gamma vortex or gamma melt up. It's what happened with <clears throat> the SoftBank. And SoftBank seemed to have a strategy to kind of front run the market on large call options. That's how it was described. Uh, maybe you can help us a little bit to understand what actually happened and if SoftBank was just just got lucky or if they actually moved the market given their, their size. Uh, in one of the last two or three commentaries I wrote, uh, and you can find all my stuff online at convexdmaven.com. I have my full archive there. If you want to get onto my distribution list, it's all free. My, my email address is there, I'll, I'll add you on. Um, and I do describe how gamma, optionality, convexity, seemingly was uh, a major contributor to the GameStop run up and run down. Um, and you're kind of saying, did that same thing apply to SoftBank? Yeah. Um, 
that's unclear. It's unclear because what SoftBank tends to own is very distant cash flows. They're investing in, I won't say startups, but fast, high growth companies that are probably actually losing money right now. They have, they have PEs of 100 or a zillion uh, because they're not making any money. I mean, the PE of Amazon, but you know, I mean, when Amazon came out in the uh, late 90s, um, I, I remember not buying it, much to my regret now, because the story was they could sell every book in the world and they could not create a PE that was even close to a market number. Um, I didn't realize that they were going to sell everything in the world, not just books. Um, yeah. And clearly, someone else figured this out. Um, but their 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 income, their cash flow, is still distant from now. Yeah. Um, and, and but what happens? What we saw is interest rates came down radically. And so, if you're going to earn, you know, a billion dollars in 30 years, you discount that billion back at five percent. You get a number, right? You get 1.05 to the 30th. Right, and then divide that by your billion. That's what your stock is worth, kind of. Um, you go do 1.01 to the 30th. It's a very different number. Yep. And so I do buy into the concept that this massive reduction of interest rates by the global central banks, you know, um, U.S. So the, the Fed, ECB, BOJ, uh, Bank of England, uh, China. Um, They've maneuvered rates down, and this naturally pumps up uh, discounted cash flows. And these growth stocks, they're like they're like seventy year duration bonds. So it's unclear that 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 SoftBank was was gamma trading per se. Uh, they may well have just been long seventy year treasuries uh, and, and rates yeah, were down. I think, I think the accusation is, and again, I'm not sure if that's true. But it seems if maybe an accusation, maybe it's a grand chess master strategy. So because all their portfolio was down, you know, in, in uh, early 2020 with the COVID crisis, because none of them really makes money. So their core equity investments and they all shut down. Many of them shut down 50, 60, 70, 80 percent of their revenues. And the idea that SoftBank had, and I think it's kind of smart, is they, they said, well, we all, we have a good amount of money left, right? They make big investments and they have a hundred billion fund. Why don't we take just two billion out of this and instead of going into more investments and creating headlines that way, which worked before, but did, nobody cared about this in May 2020, they said, why don't we stoke some fire in the equity markets? And they realized, well, the Nasdaq is big, but if you put two billion into, into high gamma options, then you kind of can pull along the market because, as you know, there, there's a lot of hedging going on by these, by, by, and there's a lot of leverage and options. So they only needed two, three, four, five billion in order to move the Nasdaq higher. Obviously, there needs to be a little bit of sentiment that that happened. And then they suddenly moved the whole market for six months to levels we've never seen before. And that was either genius or it was just plain lucky. I am unwilling to buy into that. I'm not saying you're wrong. You might be right, but but I don't think it's obvious that's what happened. It's I, I, it, it may it may be a more um, you know a, a, a correlation as opposed to causation kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, if you think about it, who's selling those options? If you had weekend speculators uh, uh, who were Robinhood traders who shorting options, then yeah, sure. Uh, if you have uh, Citadel, Susquehanna, Jane Street selling the options, you know, these guys ain't dummies. I can assure you they weren't losing money on, on these trades. And they're also hedging uh, very quickly. And to the extent that they're selling a volatility that's above, if they sell, sell a 40 vol on, you know, Amazon, yeah. and Amazon realizes a 30 vol, so they're basically buying stock every night as the stock goes up and the delta goes up, they're doing just fine. Um, and so it's unclear that that, you know, drove it, uh, to get the kind of stuff you're talking about when you almost need much, very short dated options that are very close to strike. Um, yeah. and that's what GameStop was. It was very short dated options that cross strike. Um, and you know, it's, it's a low float security. It's not like Amazon where, where you have a trillion bucks out there. These are, it's, it's so I, I, I like the GameStop story uh, more than, uh, than an Amazon or Tesla story. Yeah. If you want to have a gamma meltdown, just say, say the two of us want to, want to produce a gamma meltdown. Are we looking at 
options that are expiring relatively soon or relatively relatively far out, maybe in six or a month or one year from now? What, what should we focus on in order to move the market? Right? What we want to do is we want everyone else to that the hedge and the people we buy the options from. Once the volatility goes up, they buy more. So the stock price goes up. That's kind of our goal. How, how could we accomplish this if, say, we want to pull this off? I mean, Magamma is, is, is almost directly related. Well, it's related to two things. One is implied vol, but the other is is time uh, to maturity. Yeah. Um, and, and so the longer an option is, the less gamma it has. And if you go out far enough, there's almost no convexity or an option. And there's, there's theoretical convexity, but the deltas just don't move, um, yeah. uh, which, which, of course, is kind of, I mean, it's why my the new uh, ETF strategy we have over here, why it's um, interesting because uh, it, it's stability. Um, it's an option, but it's it's it, it, it's very stable. Uh, if you want to go create a gamma melt up, then you're going to buy uh, slightly out of the money call for like a week. That's how you that, 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 that's how you get it. But but that's going to be a very expensive option with a lot of decay, and um, uh, you got to be uh, you, you need some help uh, from from uh, outside forces. Yeah, yeah. The option you just described, it's in, and I'm, I'm curious how this fits into the, the environment that we have with the extreme low interest rates, but seemingly higher inflation. Um, how, what does it accomplish? Does it, is it a bit like a bond? And how do you buy those? Because it seems like, like multi-year options, they don't seem to be in the public markets. Okay, so I'm gonna be very careful what I say over here. So I will call this a strategy. Okay. Uh, and I will not mention tickers uh, or, 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 or any other three letter word. Um, as a base case to start with, um, I propose, uh, I believe in, in inflation and, and higher rates, but I don't want to talk about that for now, okay? Let's just leave that out for, for a moment. What I think is that if rates go higher, and by higher, I mean somewhere around three and a half to four and a half percent on like the 10 year, what will happen is the correlation of stocks to bonds will flip. For the last 20 years, what you've seen is stocks up, bonds down, and back and forth and back and forth. Um, this has been really what the key underpinning of the 60-40 portfolio, right? 60% stocks, 40% bonds, stocks up, bonds down, back and forth. So you could have volatility in both sides of this, but at the end of the day, you look at the total value of your portfolio, it hasn't moved that much or it's gone up slightly. Um, you then take this and put some nitroglycerin onto it. And what do you get? You get what's called risk parity. So you take your $100. And this, is, this, this is what Bridgewater, uh, I won't say invented, but perfected. Is you take your $100, you buy $130 of bonds and 70 bucks of stocks. And that relationship will adjust depending upon the realized correlation of these two assets. So it can go up or down. But no matter how you slice it, as I've described it, you're long $200 of assets, but you only have 100 bucks of money in your pocket. Yeah. Um, so as long as they go back and forth, you're fine. But what would happen if that correlation was to flip around and all of a sudden the stocks and bonds went up and down in unison? Well, this would be a real problem, wouldn't it, on a down market because you lose on both sides and you'd lose twice as fast because you are levered, right? You're levered two yeah. to one. Yeah. If you go look at the last two big drawdowns we've had, so a year ago, March, and then before that in end of 18, you saw stocks and bonds go down together. And when that happens, all of a sudden, everyone has to reduce their risk. Everyone's margin called. Um, and you get, you know, you know what, what we call power windows down. Um, yep. a situation. And this is when the Feds jumped in to go save the day. Um, but I mean, in, 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 in March last year, you saw stocks, bonds, gold, everything went down. Uh, this was, this could have really been a real problem with the Fed. Had, that's why the Fed jumped in, is they, they, they kind, of, kind of stopped that uh, problem. What I propose to you, and I have charts in my last commentary, that I won't say shows, well, it does show, I'm not sure it's proof, but when you have uh, inflation below two, two and a half, interest rates below uh, four ish. Um, the correlation is inverse, stocks and bonds go different directions. And what goes above that, the correlation uh, flips around and they go up and down together. Um, okay. And so, if that was to happen in a very 
highly levered, right? By leverage, I mean, we have many more bonds out there than we used to versus GDP or versus income. Uh, margin debt is at record levels. Um, short interest is at lower levels. I mean, I mean, people are basically kind of geared up to go and uh, ride the market. Um, uh, if we got above that 4% level, uh, this would be a problem on the way down. And so what I'm saying is, uh, here's a strategy where if we get you know, rates past four, you've got some protection over here. Actually, you have protection all the way up because it's an option. But I mean, it, I've, that's why I struck it at four and a quarter. Was that, that's the location where I think the correlation t turns around. And I want to have is a that, big profit. Is that, is that something... Well, and correct me again if that's wrong, but you're betting that volatility over time goes up, right? And then the price of those options goes up because it has implied volatility. Is that part of the strategy? Uh, it's an interesting benefit. It's not part of the strategy. I mean, as, as you look through my latest commentary, uh, helicopter defense, um, implied volatility now is not quite record lows, but darn close to it. Uh, and this is the case in all assets, U.S. stocks, European stocks, currencies, bonds. Why um, is that? What's your theory on why is that? That's perplexing to me. We had Mike, I, I talked to Mike Green a while ago, and, you know, he has a similar thesis that he says, well, the volatility can only go up, but it, it, it happens every couple of years. It jumps like the 50, right, in, in VIX terms. But then in between, it always looks for years has only one direction. And that seems to happen. The same cycle seems to happen all the time during the last 20 years. Um, there is a cycle to it. Um, uh, I would say that clearly the primary driver is the Fed in words and deeds. Uh, they're buying 120 billion of bonds every month. That's a lot of bonds, man. Whether, whether, whether we're issuing new stuff or not, that's a lot to buy. Yeah. And... Um, I can't keep up with these numbers anymore because sometimes it's a trillion. Then it's that. I mean, I don't even know if a hundred billion is a lot. It seems like well, it's it's tiny. It's maybe something that Goldman would buy. <laughs> I have no idea. It's still a lot of money, baby. Um, and then they've said we're not taking rates up for two years from now. So words and deeds, they've kind of said you know we're going to support the market. And then there's the perception, reasonable, that there's a a Fed put. If stocks go down by enough, they'll step in and cut rates or buy bonds or do something. Um, all these things have basically told people to go, there's no reason to buy insurance, i.e. buy options. Right? What's an option? An option is the price of insurance. They call the VIX the fear index, which is, it's, it's good marketing, um, but uh, it, 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 it is true that it is the price of insurance and the price of insurance uh, you know, is reflective of conditions. Uh, unfortunately, people tend to uh, not buy fire insurance when it's raining out and it's cheap. They buy it when the fire's already taken the house down. Um, yeah. uh, but, but I mean, if you, if you, I'll give you the the the, the similar idea. Um, the mortgage crisis, the great financial crisis. I mean, I was right there in the middle of it. Uh, I actually uh, managed a mortgage trading uh, in the uh, few years before this happened, so I'm very familiar with this whole business of how it operates. Um, and there's a lot of there's not one villain. There's lots of villains out there. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and depending which movie or book you want to write, you could point to whoever it might be. Um, I would point, um, I won't say the number one villain, but certainly your you know, top 10 villain is going to be Alan Greenspan in the Fed. What did he do uh, you know, in 03, 04, 05, 06? He said, I'm going to take rates up at a measured pace. Yeah. Measured pace. And what did that mean? It means I'm taking rates up by 25 basis points every Fed meeting, uh, so every six weeks. And and he started, and that's what he did. Well, if you know the Fed's taking rates up by 25 cents every six weeks, and you can kind of bank on that, why would you ever buy an option that rates could be up by more or less than 25 basis points? You wouldn't. As a matter of fact, if you could sell that option uh, for anything, you're going to do it because he's already told you what he's going to go and do. Well, you take this idea of measured pace, everyone sold every option or they didn't buy any insurance. What's the price of insurance? Applied vol. That's why you saw implied balls collapse 
in 06, 07, before the crisis. And at some point, imagine this, you are, you're running a bakery or a pizza oven in a, in a, in a wood building. Is that a good idea? Probably not, but you don't care because you bought lots of fire insurance, so you feel pretty safe. And it rains and rains and rains and everything goes by and the wood's always damp and like you stop buying fire insurance after a while because it's always raining out. The house is not going to burn down even though you're running a pizza oven. Uh, and time goes by and finally you say, you know, there's, there's still a price for pizza oven insurance. I'm going to go sell it. So not only do you live in a wood house for pizza oven with no insurance, you now start selling fire insurance. Yeah. That's kind of what happened is people don't only stop buying insurance, they started selling. And they sell insurance how? By selling embedded options. They weren't sorting straddles on, on this such and such. They would go and buy mortgage securities or corporate bonds that had embedded optionality. So they were effectively short options. And when you go and look at um, the subprime bonds, the bottom bonds, actually, they, I mean, they were fine. They were priced to, to blow up, and they did. It was the doubles and triple A's that were priced to perfection. Yeah. I mean, if you're buying a double A bond at, you know, 50, 60, uh, 30, 40, 50 over LIBOR, what's your upside? Half a point? What's your downside? A lot. It was the triple A bonds that took down Wall Street. It wasn't the double and triple B's. Yeah. Wasn't the no, equity. of course. Of course. And I, I still don't understand why anyone would invest in those. I mean, unless you have those, these really contracted, con contracting timeframes i think this is maybe it's a sign of times or maybe it's been like this forever but we live in a time where we feel emotionally that time has, has has shortened has contracted right we five days on twitter it's like i don't understand i don't have any memory what was five days ago when i read on twitter so my my universe of of, of time has has is maybe a year out i can barely remember it was two or three years out and I think this is now we're seeing this reflected in investment where nobody really wants to think back 20 years because they feel, oh, this doesn't apply anymore because I know what's going on and I've seen it during the last two years and that's enough to know, right? And, and a bit like this this was with the, with the back test that we've seen for the structured products and, and mortgages, they were tested 20, 30, 40 years and uh, we've never seen major declines in, 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 in rents and house prices, so it cannot happen, right? So that was the end of the story and then the story was sold and it was very effectively sold and everyone bought into it. Well, I mean, look, I'm going to make a bet that if you're making any money on this TV show you're doing right now, that your por personal portfolio probably has a lot of options you've sold and you haven't thought about very, very clearly. And number two, I mean, just open your eyes, man. What's Where where are junk bonds trading at? 3.9%. Really? <laughs> really? Yeah. I mean, why, why, did you look, why did you have to go look at subprime housing bonds? Just look at junk bonds right now in front of us. You have no wiggle room whatsoever. And why is that? Well, because the Fed has rates at 25 cents, because Europe has rates at negative, Japan has 10-year rates at 0.1, um, Swissy rates are negative, whatever. I mean, the Fed and central banks have put a gun to our head to go and, and find yield, and people are buying various securities at clearly the wrong price, but it almost doesn't matter. Yeah. Because if they, I mean, if you don't buy your junk bonds at four percent, then you're going to buy, you know, a three-year treasury at 0.4. I mean, yeah. pension funds, insurance companies, they have to go and 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 and, and they have liabilities they got to meet. So, yeah. I mean, the Fed is forcing people into um, bad scenarios. Yeah. Well, one thing I think you that I saw in one of your commentaries is. The kind of the return, or maybe it's never went away of the carry trade. I mean, we used to know the carry trade um, was typically it was very low yielding currency. This is where you got the money from. You put it somewhere else, and then you play with it, and you hope interest rates are kind of stable, so you get your money or something similar to that when you invest it back. Well, where do you see carry trades right now? Are they still such a big factor? Is there trillions parked in some carry trades that we don't even know about? I'm sure there are carry trades out there. Uh, they're just you know. Challenging. I mean, I mean, an easy one probably is Mexico, right? I mean, that yields probably about five, six. And uh, you could fund that in Japan. You could fund that uh, in Euro. Um, yeah. Is that a good trade or a bad trade? I don't know. But I mean, it's not like they've gone away. And I, Mexico is probably a lot uh, more rational than Brazil or Argentina or something like that. Um, 
I mean, I mean, I, I mean, to some extent, Mexico is the 51st state who's kind of linked to the U.S. economy. So, uh, that, I mean, my bad. money would be on Turkey, right? So very high interest rates, but very high inflation also. Is there a way to hedge the interest rate um, differential so that you don't see very different interest rate a couple of years down the line when you want to pull your money back out? Oh, it's very easy to hedge these things. But the thing is, once you hedge out all the risk, you're back to your base security. And yeah, the markets yeah. are efficient. So, exactly. So I mean, maybe there is something that people don't know where you can get really cheap hedges for this. No. The, the, well, I actually uh, wrote about Turkey uh, two or three years ago. I actually put on a trade uh, in the Turkish. I, I did the Turkish lira versus the euro uh, when the yeah. Turkish rates were, were very high. And I went out like three years. And what happens is you can get these uh, futures. Forward, but they're effectively Turkish futures out three years from the currency, um, yeah. and uh, uh, you can get some interesting scenarios there uh, where you only lose if things really go haywire. Um, I'm out of the trade; I got out of it a uh, you know, year and change ago, which I'm glad about because it turns out things did go haywire. Um, I, 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 I proposed at the time that uh, Turkey uh, wanted to be, you know, a civilized country that would have a working banking system. Uh, and would could draw in foreign investment, and therefore they would uh, the central bank would be given independence to raise and lower rates to stabilize the currency, so foreign investment would feel safe coming in. Um, yeah, that didn't happen lately. It, 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 it happened. It happened for a while, uh, yeah. but uh, it, it 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 didn't happen clearly. I mean, they they fired the central bank banker, so that was that. Yeah. Well, I know you're very inventive with these things, but I was always thinking, man, there would be someone out there who needs that exchange rate. I lock it in in three years from now because for some reason that that person wants to take the other side of the trade. I know Goldman Sachs is really good at this, actually finding <clears throat> individual private counterparts. And that would give you a very low cost hedge, so to speak. You don't have to go into a public market, but obviously then you 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 worry about that counterparty risk, right? Okay, the counterparty risk is, I won't say irrelevant, but irrelevant. If you're if you're facing J.P. Morgan or Goldman Sachs, um, you're fine. Um, you got bigger problems than that. Um, yeah. What you're really digging into now, and and the trades you've described, are not weird, crazy things. They are liquid, active, on on a screen of sorts, um, but they require an ISDA, I S D A, an okay. ISDA agreement is a contract between all the various professionals, hedge funds, uh, the um, investment banks, the pensions, the insurance companies, the corporate borrowers, um, all these professionals have a unified single contract. There's a few tweaks, but they do that so everyone transacts in an apples to apples way. So if I buy from Goldman Sachs, I can sell to Morgan Stanley and the whole thing goes away. So it's a, it's a unified contract. That contract is only available to professionals or very ultra high net worth people. Um, and this is where you get really interesting opportunities where you get really customized trades uh, and you can go out more than six months. I mean, you, you, you really don't find options. Maybe for SPY, you can go out two years. Most of the things you can't really go past three to six months. And so the entire reason I joined Simplify was they offered a way to take an ISDA product and I could pierce the ISDA veil and offer an ISDA product to civilians. Civilians is non-professionals. And uh, our first strategy is exactly that, where we take a seven-year option and offer it to people. Uh, and it's a way of getting both convexity and predictability and performance. It's a simple two asset strategy where you buy half initially $25 of treasuries and $12 of a seven year option on the 20 year interest rate struck at four and a quarter. Remember that four and a quarter? Well, I got that from before. That, that's where I think the uh, correlation flips. Yeah. Um, and because it's a seven year option, it's extraordinarily stable. The theta is very small uh, and has tremendous convexity. Uh, this the, 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 the strategy can go down a little bit. It can go up a lot um, yeah. and it'll trade on an exchange. So it's point and click.
like an uh, ETF, right? So it's an ETF yeah. that I can actually buy. Yes. Yeah. So what would be the scenario? So if the interest rates really go up, say, to 10%, which is a scenario, if, you know, we, 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 the Fed gets into trouble, that would be a big payoff thing for that product? Funny you should ask. Um, yeah. <laughs> uh, if you go to page four of my most recent commentary yeah. on my website, uh, I have modeled. This is not a promise. It's a model of how this should look, and it's kind of easy to do. Uh, you could price it on Bloomberg, um, and all you got to do is basically play with this thing. Um, so right now, if the price comes out, if, if the price was 50 on a model um, up 300 basis points, this thing would go to um, anywhere between 160 and 185, um, and maybe higher than that, depending upon volatility. Um, so uh, that's, a, that's a pretty fancy, uh, fancy move. Yeah, and the That's comparison right. is this, by the way, if you took the, let's just say that uh, you modeled it the way I think, and you put in some volatility increase, the price would go, uh, and and you waited two years, so it takes years to happen, uh, and rates go up three hundred basis points, so just a five percent. They're four, two now. They go. And you're talking ten. Forget ten. Let's, let's go from two to five. Yeah, you go from dollar price of fifty to one eighty six, and if yeah. you were short futures. You'd only go to eighty-eight, okay. so it's vastly more powerful than a futures contract. Yeah, if the interest rate stays the same, then you know you lose all your principal, right? Mm -hmm. If nothing happens. Uh, well, no, because first off, in this particular structure, initially, if you've paid fifty, half that money is in a treasury. Oh, yeah. So the okay. worst case is twenty-five. Yeah. Um, let's talk more realistically. Uh, if you bought this thing today, as I've modeled it. Not a promise, as I've modeled it. If you buy today at 50, in two years, everything else is the same, but the clock has been turned. Uh, it's worth 44. So it goes down by, goes down by 12%. That's yeah. it. Yeah. Well, and I that's like been, that. I and like that's because, yeah, yeah. Well, and, and that's because it's a seven year option, which does not decay that quickly. If, if, if I was buying a three month option, it'd be all gone. Yeah. That's that's more, more for the gamblers than us. One other thing that, you know, we, 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 we talked about the, the mortgage crisis. Uh, the way to actually trade this, if you had that conviction that something was going on, only very few experts had that, is to find CDSs. And I remember that from the movie, right, how difficult it was even for professional investors to get the, the, uh, the yes. credit default swaps. Yes. Is there a way, and you mentioned the ISA login, to, to get access to the CDSs? And is that something that you might plan to put into another product? Ah. Another juicy meatball coming over the plate. Uh, yes, we have this product in registration right now. Uh, and it'll be, uh, you uh, roughly, you give us $100 or you buy $100 of, of, of the asset. Um, and then maybe 10%, 10 of those dollars would go into uh, CDS options. So actually, actually not the swaps, but the options on the swap. So you have a lot of convexity and a lot of leverage um, it's basically, it's, a, it's like a tail hedge strategy for credit as opposed to equity. Um, and what, uh, what would they, um, what are the credit default <coughs> swaps on? Is it, is it, what, what kind of securities are the underlying? Uh, it, it, it would be on the investment grade index. So it's called the IG, CDX okay. space IG space five year. So it's, a, yeah. it's basically a basket of five year high grade, so investment grade credit. So triple B and better. There is a CDS index for junk bonds, uh, a high yield index. Yeah. Um, this is not that. This would be, this would be on, on the IG portfolio. If I were convinced that say Uber will default soon on their, on their bonds, is there a product for me to buy right now as a, as a non-institutional investor? Well, to default on their bonds, the stock would go to zero. So, I mean, right, because the bonds are in front of Uber. So, I mean, you just buy puts yeah. on the stock. But they only have two, uh, I don't know, two billion in, 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 in bonds. And I don't know, they still have a hundred billion in, in, in cash lying around from SoftBank. And thus it's quite unlikely that, that they, they would default. be bankrupt. I suspect that those bonds would not, um, they probably trade fairly tight to treasuries and they're probably a quality credit. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I've not looked at, at, at Uber, Uber bonds. Yeah. Um, so, and, and it's possible that they've structured them in some way where they're, 
I don't know, unsecured with some kind of, you know, funny language in the contract, but I, I, I doubt that. I, I, I suspect that it's, it's a legitimate quality investment grade bond. Yeah. Well, the, 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 uh, the credit default swaps, they're such an, a, a wonderful instrument if you have a certain conviction because they, it's very cheap, right? So the, the, it, because it's just as insurance and if you even have an option on this, <clears throat> you need very little equity and have eventually a huge payoff. It might never happen, but if it happens, it's like 1,000 thousand X probably or 10,000 X. Uh, I don't think it's that, that big of a multiple, but, okay. but yeah, it, it's, um, it, it depends how you buy it and how much leverage you put on. I mean, that's the thing is, is if you, if you, in the strategy I've described over here, you're buying a $50 instrument. Another instrument, $200 is treasury and $200 is option. That $200 option is on kind of, kind of a thousand dollar bond. So, I mean, you think about $25 controls $1,000 of bond. Yeah. That's where you get the real leverage from is, is, are you doing apples to apples? Now, if you then bought, you know, you can say I have a $1,000 bond or I'm going to buy $1,000 of options. Well, now you're talking about, you know, options on what, what you know, 40, 40,000 bucks plus 1,000, right? 25 yeah. times 40. Yeah. So, I mean, it, it, it's you got to be careful that you apples to apples things. You can't compare a dollar investment of option with a dollar investment of the underlying asset because the yeah. option controls so much more of it. Yeah. Um, so uh, that's uh, that, that, that can be a little tricky bond math when people try to do comparisons. Uh, t- I mean, tail hedge funds tend to go and, uh, and uh, advertise that way. Uh, they advertise how much the premium has moved uh, as opposed to uh, how much protection it afforded you for the actual principal investment you had. Yeah. So yeah. when you, and you know, we, we are doing all this math right now with the <clears throat> different ways of leverage and <clears throat> how we can get this leverage. Do you think there's like a structural risk that um, <clears throat> I'm sorry. <clears throat> do you, do you think there's a structural risk? that we, we are all looking at these layers and layers of leverage, right? We just went through it. And so do does everyone else because we have all the same problem, right? We want the right complexity and we want, obviously, we want to have some decent return. We are not happy with 0.1%. Is there a risk, a structural risk, that once we go into one of these drawdown liquidity events like we had last year, that this whole system can come apart and we, we, we all go, all assets go to... to 10% of what they were before. Uh, really quickly, like in the matter of the last crisis showed us this was just a week or two and this thing dropped like 60%. Uh, it, how big is that risk? The Fed's, the Fed's not let that happen, okay? I mean, the, the, the question really is, if the Fed hadn't stepped in in March, how low we've gone? Um, that's unclear. I mean, could there be a systemic crisis where you really go down a lot more? Maybe. I mean, what you really had there, what you had in March, the was was not a credit it was not a, a, a an economic crisis per se. Although that certainly we did go into a recession. It was a credit crisis. It was a liquidity crisis. You couldn't borrow money. No one would lend anybody money. And if you and so all of a sudden, if you can't borrow money, even against high quality assets. You have to sell them. I mean, why would people be selling treasuries in March of last year? That's kind of crazy. I mean, you know that they're going to, the government's still solid. Um, rates are going to go, are not going to go up a lot. Um, why are you selling treasuries? You're selling them because you can't borrow money from anywhere else and you have to raise money to meet a margin call. And so that was the issue here you had was it was a, it was a global systemic margin call as opposed to an actual real recession economic problem can that happen again um i suppose so but i imagine the fed would step in and buy stocks and bonds they do everything to stop a, a total meltdown but the problem is each time you do that you just inflate the balloon even more what you really want to do here and, and the fed had their chance to get out of this mess 2013 uh and and, and they got you know a small 100 basis point rise in rates the taper tantrum, you know, scared them away. And that, that, was, that, that really is, you know, kind of ground zero for this whole mess we're in right now. 
the, we had a chance to get rates up and to get you know the market stabilized again, um, where uh, the, the, the capital markets could operate, you know, uh, without trading wheels. And, and the Fed screwed that up. Um, and now we got a problem where we kind of can't live without the drug. I think that the Fed wants higher rates in the back end, not short term rates. I think we're higher to the back end. I think the Fed wants the steeper, steeper yield curve. I think the Fed wants inflation. Not inflation, but three, four, they could live with that. You know, they'd say, they'd say, well, we ran for one, one and a half for five years, so we could run at three or four for a few years because we're averaging it. So they, they, they laid the narrative out to tolerate inflation for a while. It's better than a revolution, right? I feel like when you when you think about where the federal government is and where their Fed is, they feel like, well, if we if we don't inflate out of this, we're going to have a revolution on our hands, a literal revolution, like an economic revolution. And this is the only way they see they can do without major pushback, right, from the electorate. I don't like talking politics because I only get in trouble doing that. Yeah. But, okay. but we already had the revolution. Okay. The reason why we had the election we did in 2016 is because the Fed tried to create um, inflation for wages for middle class workers. Remember, when you have, we have too much debt. How do you get out of debt? You default or you inflate. And inflation is a slow motion default. So the Fed was going to engineer inflation to reduce the amount of debt we had that had been created from the great financial crisis in 08, 09, and 10. Yeah. Um, and that was the plan. The problem you have, though, is that the money did not go to ordinary people who would spend it and then create increased spending and velocity of money but rather it stayed in the banking system and inflated assets. Yep. Uh, the notion that the Fed did not create inflation or the government cannot create inflation is bogus. I, I, that gets almost angering to me. How could you possibly say we have not had inflation? We've had massive inflation, stocks, bonds, yep. gold, housing, art, jewelry, everything. We have not had inflation though in, in wages. And by not having inflation in wages, but getting it in the asset side, you widened out the uh, the wealth gap, and thus we have the politics is a is a contributing factor to our politics today. And so once again, I will lay not all, maybe not even most, but a significant amount of blame at the Fed for enhancing the wealth gap, which is a public policy bad. Yeah, no, I think I share your analysis, and it's very very crystal very clear and very crisp what what i think happened to and that's <clears throat> to an to an extent nobody could foresee this is obviously the rise of china and willingness of china to make things so much cheaper consumer products haven't gone up because they are getting cheaper um and we now see it on the internet a lot of software even hardware products and not just china this is also part of silicon valley they seem to get cheaper by massive amounts 50 percent, 100 percent every year so this consumer price index that has that option to, to be spent on software, internet, communications, um, anything that is hardware that comes from China, as China influence, this is getting cheaper at such an amazing rate. Nobody can induce inflation. I don't, I don't think you can because there's so much innovation happening that it's deflating by, by massive <coughs> amounts. And everything where you don't have these influences, we see massive inflations, right? Housing, as you said, intuition. But if we solve those, if we make this thesis, and nobody knew that 10 years ago, that we have this massive deflationary potential and bring, bring it to the other industry, maybe we solved inflation for now. Uh, I mean, look, you cer we certainly imported deflation by moving uh, high cost US labor overseas, um, which at the macro level is a good thing. I mean, Clinton was right, uh, the first Clinton, uh, with, with NAFTA. I mean, that was, a, that was a public policy good. At the macro level, the country did better. Problem is, is the people who were displaced were not then retrained to do other jobs. I and mean, we've had this problem before. I mean, last time I checked, we got rid of the, of the horses and the, and, the, and the buggies and did other and started building cars and, and airplanes. Um, the government seems to have, you know, missed missed the boat here on taking the people who were displaced, the people who are making shoes or or, or, or garments uh, or other, you know, 
low tech items, these people should have been somehow retrained and reallocated to areas uh, where, where, where there's growth and where the compensation is greater. And we didn't do that. That's not practical. I don't think that's practical. You know, I'm, I grew up in Eastern Germany and putting people into places where they should work, it's never going to work. The capital allocation is crap. It's always going to lag behind you and the private market. And we have a private market. And to an extent, yes, people had huge trouble finding new jobs that pay equally good. But there isn't, we cannot shortcut this, right? The market can decide were this individual skill is usable. And maybe this is usable at all anymore, but that happens, right? So the greater good is we let the best possible asset allocation work its way out. And I think it works. I mean, it might take 10 years, right? So we see the same now with AI that makes you know decision-making so much cheaper. It will put a lot of people out of job for an extended period, but then there is like 10 years later, there is this possibility of basically sitting on your couch and making 10 times as much as you made before. Well, I mean, you know, if, if, if you don't have a job, you're not going to last 10 years. Um, and I disagree. I think the government, can, I think the government doesn't pick you up and move you. The government can go and help retrain you. I mean, there are plenty of jobs out there that do not require a college degree. I mean, all the electrical, plumbing jobs, welding jobs, those are all paid very well. Um, construction jobs, those are those are jobs where lots of things, or, or you can be in technology. You can work a spreadsheet, you can work Word, you can work answering. These kinds of skills are... Well, you can go to YouTube. You can do, I don't know, a Python or a data data scientist master's degree in a year fully online on YouTube for like a hundred bucks or a thousand bucks. That's it. That, that is doable, but you know, it, clearly, uh, people need help. I mean, the people who are watching this this video right now probably are are, are well educated people involved in, in whatever it might be. There are other people who need more assistance. And once again, we're going to politics here, but nonetheless, I, I think that you know there was clearly there was a transition of labor, you know, over the last 20, 30 years, and the result was not good for certain sets of people. At a macro level, yeah. the country did better, but yeah. the allocation of those assets was not, uh, was, you know, diverse. I agree, I agree. And I mean, there's no reason we should give startups 0% um, interest loans. That's just, that, that's, I mean, it's great, it's great when you're in the startup industry, and obviously that's, but that's only accessible through a certain size of startups. So most startups, and funnily enough, we have, um, a lot of seed funds, we have bubble up, this bubbling up of seed funds. So the idea is really just like in, in 2000, you start something and a year later, it's big enough to go IPO. Everything that doesn't go into this growth factor, into this narrative, you don't want to be involved in, which is really strange, right? It's really greedy. It sounds really greedy to me. It has nothing to do with real innovation. Yeah, well, we shall see. Hopefully, hopefully we'll uh, you know find some way to uh, you know revitalize ourselves. I mean, I, I'm, I'm still believing that the U.S. is going gonna, is gonna to do well at the end of the day. Uh, we, we do have a a, a core competency in creativity, which uh, is not the case in most of the countries. Yeah. Well, they're getting there, right? I, I, I think they're all on that way, but they are maybe 20 years behind or 10 years behind, whatever the, the, the delta is. But I think everyone is seeing the same pressures. Wherever you go in the world, they might be behind and they might, they're not ready to make the hard decisions, but they, they definitely have the same pressure because wherever you go, and Turkey might be the exception, but most of the places you go that is relatively advanced and industrialized, you, you, see, you, see, you see the 0% interest rates, which seems to be a disease that's spreading, right? And for, for me, it makes no sense that it happens everywhere and there seems to be something bigger going on. It's not the fault of the Fed. Well, we can fault the Fed that it's doing the same what others are doing and should have a better policy. But it seems to be whenever you reached whatever 40,000 GDP or 50,000 GDP, that problem hits you and it might go away in 20 years from now. Well, I mean, you're kind of backing into, I mean, I'm not a believer that China will overtake the U.S. anytime soon uh, for a number of reasons. Um, one of them, the, I mean, the primary one is, um, is the culture of creativity. Uh, China is very good at taking our ideas and making them cheaper. Um, but that is not creative. That's not making new, new, new thoughts up. But also, uh, there is a, a school of thought that says that once you get per capita GDP above ten to twelve thousand, you can no longer operate an economy uh, as a top-down authoritarian. Uh, and you saw this in uh, in South Korea, uh, which is basically a dictatorship. You know, forty years ago, and once the income got above a certain level, they had to become a democracy to basically push decision-making down the chain. You can't run an economy that large and complicated uh, from the top. Uh, China has a GDP of about 9,000 right now. So they have not reached that inflection point. And the question is, is it viable 
uh, for them to have a GDP of 15,000 or 20,000 per person and be top down, uh, command and control, uh, unclear. Uh, the evidence is that it hasn't happened yet, but they can be the first. Yeah, yeah, they've been the first in a lot of things, right? And China shouldn't have happened from classical economic theory. It should have been at least much more democratic by now. But that hasn't happened yet. But you know, who knows? Maybe it happens in 10 years from now. From my point of view, I see this big um, rollout of technology through areas that we've, we've, we've never seen before. Like construction is basically not touched by technology. Healthcare is basically not touched in real terms. Even cars, a lot of major investments haven't really been touched by technology. And I always think about this, the socialist utopia is that we suddenly have these the ability to do do something once we innovate once and then we can roll it out infinitively like we do with software right that goes to other industries now and if you put ai on top of this as a decision making guide it's the same thing you just incorporate it in a different kind of algorithm and then make better smarter decisions um, we're still humans on the end and can make the final decision but we have more guidance we have better core decision making what i feel how if this happens the way i envision it then the industrialized societies with the most data scientists, with the most infrastructure, they will have the biggest growth rates. So we will go from where we are, what we are seeing now, we see the US and Europe with the lowest growth rates, and then we have the catch up countries at much higher growth rates. That will change a lot. The US will be at, I don't know, 9%, and everyone else who's not at that level yet has much lower growth rates. So it's a, it's a reversal of what we've seen, I don't know, last 30 years. You're talking productivity, which has been flat for quite a while, and yeah. I hope you're right. Yeah, <laughs> I guess we, I guess we all do. Um, well, it's it's it would be a possible way out of this crisis, right? So if we we increase productivity and we make our own assets generating much more cash, real cash, not just inflated cash, then that's another way out of this debt bubble that we're in. Well, I, I will circle back that you are correct. There's actually three ways out of a debt crisis: you can default, you can inflate, or you can grow. Uh, we had the last time we had a, a debt levels like this was right after World War II. Um, and, um, and we got out by this massive growth in the 50s and 60s. And that's how you got out of it. Could, if you think we can grow at 5 6% a year, um, uh, if we, real, if you think it's possible, that will resolve uh, our, our, our debt prices. I agree. Do you uh, feel? I, yeah. yeah, yeah, and no, you, yeah you, that's it, yeah. You, you, you make that on your website. Um, that's kind of your, your, your core statement. It's all about character. When, when, we, when we think about this, this expectations, do you feel we've not been daring enough the last 30 years because productivity growth is so much lower? We don't go to the moon anymore, right? We, we, don't, we don't go to Mars now. We may go again. But have we not been daring enough? And that's a problem. We've been too conservative with our forward expectation. That's how we see this, this horrible growth rates. And if we change that mindset and character, if we behave like we should be, how a good investors should behave and not just do this FOMO thing, this trend following all the time and treat it as a casino on Wall Street. If we change this in our minds, do you think we go back to these high growth rates? Is that maybe a big, bigger impact? That is a political science question, not a financial question. Sure. Um, and, 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 you know, I have various thoughts on that. And I would say that there's no right answer. I mean, clearly, um, you know, we've seen uh, a decline in productivity um, and uh, other various problems. Uh, what is the cause of them and how are they fixed is unclear. Uh, I tend to think that the, uh, the, the, the uh, Internet and social media has probably been the, um, uh, you know, where the big turn was, uh, because a lot of things have to happen. Um, sausage is made in a, in a, in a, in a dark room because it's just not good to look at. And um, politics, uh, the smoke-filled room, you know, that was always a bad idea. But if you think about it, do you ever want to seem compromising in public? No, you want to go and beat your chest and say, I won, I got this, I got that. Compromises, you know, should happen in small, dark places. And when you have the internet and social media, you lose the ability to go and say, fine, I will, I'll, I'll only take half of what I want. So what we see now is I want the whole loaf or I want no loaf. Why can't there be compromise? And um, I, think, I think it's because you can't do this. You can't negotiate quietly and privately. Um, yeah. And people, when you had, um, you had to go write someone a letter or someone up or see them in, in the street, you had time to think about things and consider what you were going to say. If you just can go and type it out on a, uh, 
on, on, on a text or a, uh, a social media tweet. Um, sometimes, you know, uh, your emotions get ahead of, of, of your thoughts. Um, when I write, I, I tend to prefer communicating with email uh, because it allows me to go and really think about what I want to say. And when I give it to a person, they then read it and they have to look at it and read it. Most conversations are someone's talking to me or at me and I'm not listening. I'm thinking about what am I going to say next back to them. And therefore, there's really no comprehension of the thought. If I go write someone a letter or an email or whatever, they're not in a hurry to go respond to me. They could think about it. They could consider it. When I write uh, a, 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 a deep letter to someone, a correspondence, I'll write it and I'll put it in the draft and I'll sit on it for a night because nothing has to, I mean, there are a few things that have to go out immediately. Most things can wait a day or two. And you want to think about reading it the next day. And is this really what I think? Um, especially if it's, if it's a, a strong communication uh, and, and, and we've lost that, um, not the ability, but we just don't do it anymore. Yeah, I feel like we, we this definitely happened, but we also have, have discovered a lot of inconvenient truths that were basically baked into the cake, baked into the, how the U.S. was founded, how the world is sitting on this treasure of knowledge, and some is from the Greeks, some is from, from a Judeo-Christian heritage. We have a lot of things that we never really thought about, and we, we kind of acted out our daily life, the daily routine. We didn't have time to think about that. Now we have more time, right, because we're more efficient or maybe because we're out of work, whatever that, whatever the reason is. But we have time to, to reconsider, actually, where do we come from and what do we actually want? And also, I think we, we, we need that, that, re, that we reorient ourselves, A, and B, we also need like an, an enemy, right? We didn't have a real global enemy for the longest time, for like 30 years. Um, so we, we need a, a, a counter example to what we don't want. We always had communist Russia, right? We had this for, for 80, 90 years almost, and it definitely helped the United States to define itself. And I think this really weird chaotic debate that we have, and as weird as it is on Twitter, and I fully agree with you, and it's definitely not thought out, it's, it's a good thing. I feel it's, it's something that can really start, if we want to get to this global productivity rise, it, there needs to be a reorientation besides just the technology because we have to adopt it. And for the longest time, we had cool technology, but nobody wanted it. Like 2013, 2020, you used to tell someone, oh, I work from home, but people look at you, what? So a lot of things was in the shelves, but it wasn't being taken out. And I feel this is really happening now. That's kind of what makes me really positive. That is a school of thought. Yeah. I disagree. <laughs> well, I my disagree. opinion is that <laughs> I, I disagree say, completely. Yeah. I, th I think we have less time. This idea we have more time available, that's, that's false. We have, we have yeah. less time available. People are plugged in all the time. Your brain is never turned off. Um, you know, once upon a time, the markets would close at, you know, whatever, three o'clock, four o'clock in the afternoon, and they were closed, man, until nine o'clock the next day. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I, I lived through that. And you're trying to think about things. The payroll number would come out at 8.30 and the markets would not turn on until 9 o'clock. And we'd go to the back and we'd talk about the payroll number and then we'd come on at 9 o'clock, screens flashed on. Now you're trading all the time. Um, people have their iPhones, their computers, or whatever, they're reading their emails, they're at work all the time. Uh, when I used to go on vacation, and I have a very good vacation website at bassman.net, um, uh, I would go on vacation, man. I was tuned out. No newspapers, no nothing. And I remember my boss asked me once uh, very early on, like, well, uh, how do we get a hold of you if we, if we need you? Um, and I said, you don't. I said, I mean, if it's, a, if it's a small problem, you don't need me. If it's a big problem, I can't fix it. Like, what am I going to do from, you know, from the, from the Caribbean? Nothing. Uh, a good manager makes sure that he, ha he hired people who are competent below him who can give him coverage. When I, when my... Uh, team, when someone would go on vacation, I would say, you're on vacation. I don't want to hear from you. You need time to turn your brain off and reinvigorate yourself and recharge yourself. And I remember one of my guys called me up once, asked what's going on. I said, I don't care. Click. I hung up on him. You don't need to know what the market's doing. You need, you're on vacation. And I think we've lost that totally where um, uh, it, 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 it it's a brave new world where, where we have input coming at us constantly and we're, and our brains are supercharged. So it's the total opposite of what you've described here. It's having more time available. I think we have less time available to think and consider things. 
maybe which is dangerous yes yes, yes um definitely i mean there's obviously danger to all this to all of this i just feel these things are happening without our consent anyways like the, the, the best thing we can do is be bored by it which is happening now with social media a little bit people are just over this 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 empty excitement kind of like um, the first couple of times you eat fast food, you really love that taste and you think it's cheap, it's a good deal and you're like into it. And then when you remember as a teenager and then eventually you're like, whoa, this isn't for me, right? And I think the same is happening to social media. People need that time to go through this experience. And I, I do have that, that faith in people that they figure out what's good and that will stay around. You know, Americans are really good at this. We make all the mistakes first and then we realize what's good. But I think it's better than the alternative is just categorically saying, this is new, that might be dangerous, let's not touch it. That's the European approach, uh, to an extent, the Japanese approach. I don't want anything with, to do with this, right? So risk-taking is really about seeing what is the potential benefit, and then obviously if sometimes you pay dearly for it. Um, mm -hmm. Hopefully, it, it didn't happen this time. I think America is coming out of this COVID thing pretty nicely now. It, it took a long time. It does seem to be that way, yes. Well, with this positive news, Harley, thank you so much for coming on. Thank you for your insight. Thanks for being on the podcast. It's been great to be here. Thank you very much. It's, it's fun to go and chat with the intelligent people with the clever ideas. Appreciate that. I'm looking forward to next time. Thank you very much. Marty, take it easy. Bye-bye.